Uh, welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort this time with Jeff Martha, the CEO of Medtronic, which I am excited about. Jeff, I've wanted to do this for a while. Um, the space uh, in health and medical technology where you guys are so important has become clearly so important globally, um, especially over the past year and a half. So uh, I'm glad we get to talk. I I'm going to jump right in. I always ask first, what's the toughest problem that you're solving for today? I mean, I can guess what yesterday's, but last year's toughest problem was, but what is it that you're working on today that's um, consuming the majority of your attention? Well, first, uh, John, thanks for having me. I I've been wanting to do this for a long time as well, so I'm looking forward to this. And in terms of your question, yeah, you know, COVID is, um, thankfully, mostly in the rearview mirror for us. It, it's not completely gone. Obviously, we're still, you know, places like India and Latin America, and there's still major issues there, and it's still a big crisis. But uh, we definitely see the light at the end of the tunnel. And, and really, right now, I, I think the biggest problem that, that we're looking at is how to capitalize. And look, the, the last 18 months, put aside COVID, the technology advancement in the last 18 months to two years, whether it be uh, miniaturization of electronics, uh, you know, robotics, you hear a lot about battery technology. People equate that to, you know, Tesla and vehicles, but there's a lot of battery technology advancements in implantable electronics. So the batteries that we use for pacemakers and things like that, they're smaller, they last longer. And then you add, you know, data and, and, and AI, all these things coming together, uh, a lot of, uh, it, it really changes the game. And we see a paradigm shift for the medical technology industry and our place in healthcare. So, so, so tell me some more about that. I mean, what is possible today with some of the technological advancements that you're mentioning that two or three years ago we couldn't have had? Well, I'll give you some examples. I did bring some 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 samples here. That's uh, good. Good. You know, so so um, it is a technology uh, show here. So, you know, one thing this this little pill here, right here. This this is I hope to be your future colonoscopy, right? And you know, I don't today know how I feel about that, but okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't need to describe <laughs> today's procedure, right? But it it's, right. it's somewhat invasive. It's expensive. You're you're under anesthesia. You're in a hospital. You have you know a number of physicians in the room, uh, and uh, you know tomorrow we hope, uh, and this is in, in clinical trials now, that this device and it's it combines you know miniaturization of electronics um, and and uh, communication protocol. This you swallow this. Uh, it, it, you know, it beams images to your cell phone, which is wow. into the cloud. Your cell phone is just a communication device that you don't okay. see the images. So you the said cloud. you swallow this. Can you hold that up again so that yeah, people yeah. can get a sense? That's yeah. like, that's the size of a big pill. Like one it's of a vitamin. It's a big vitamin. vitamin. Yeah, 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 yeah. You look like a healthy guy. Take a big multivitamin every day. I mean, it, it, it's like that. And, and it beams the images to your phone into the cloud where we're running, uh, you know, AI algorithms uh, to look at these images and actually pick out the polyps and then beam the, the, the report down to your physician who looks at it and all the polyps, if there are any, are highlighted in green, if not, you know, and our data shows that we're like 20% better uh, than physicians at identifying polyps, which, you know, could turn to cancer. And what this does is one, it improves the diagnosis, but two, it frees up a ton of hospital capacity because seven out of 10 colonoscopies are clean. And so you, those seven patients don't need to go to the hospital. So there's a, there's a huge cost and access play here and a, an improvement of, of outcomes. And, and it's a combination of a number of different technologies coming together, Na a big one being artificial, the da use of data and artificial intelligence. Tell me how uh, artificial intelligence plays in here because you know, naturally my brain, I'm focused on this pill and the idea that I'm swallowing it and it's beaming uh, images of, of my insides up to the cloud, which is great if I don't have to go the traditional Mickey Mouse glove route. But, right. um, but how does AI play in there? Is that the identification of what could be dangerous that's happening inside me? Is, is that where AI plays in? Exactly. So, so in the way we've built these algorithms is t today, it's more than a Mickey Mouse uh, a glove, it glove. It's actually a probe uh, with a camera on it, and and these physicians are looking at that video real time, uh, determining if they see a a, a a polyp or not, which are hard to pick out, right? So we've taken all those videos from thousands and thousands of actual procedures, and and uh, developed these algorithms, trained these algorithms to pick out those polyps. 
Uh, and, and so that's where the AI, the AI comes in is to pick out those polyps. And you know, it is tough if, if you're if a physician to, to see these things, especially live and especially after doing like eight colonoscopies in a, in a given day. Now, normally I wait on questions from the audience, but I see somebody familiar here and it's a good question. Right, so uh, my, my colleague Bertha Coombs happens to be turning in, a asking a question that really fits in with some of the themes that I'm sure you're thinking about, that a lot of people are thinking right. about security. Um, and, and it's so important with medical technology. H how does that play into how you're thinking, not only about this particular technology, but how you're thinking about medical technology and what you hope to accomplish, given that data right. is such a big part of it going forward? Look, this, this is a hot topic and, and, I, and I can tell you, we um, um, meet with the FDA on a quarterly basis at the highest levels uh, to talk about this, not, not on just any one product, but strategically, what are the things we need to do to make sure that first and foremost, you know, the data is secure from, from, from hackers and, and then protected, you know, from, from a privacy perspective. And, you know, we've actually gone out uh, in partnership with the FDA and, and we've hired hackers and so have they. And, and to, to really test. Uh, and, and this is another area where we work with um, the other companies in the industry. Yeah, we compete, but on, on topics like this, uh, we need to learn from each other uh, and, 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 and protect each other in this way. So, so there's a high, a lot of focus on, on not just you know, protecting data security, but then, then there's the data privacy aspect. And I'm not sure which angle that Beth, that Beth was coming from or both, but then the, the privacy look, you know, we, you know, we, you know, are very, you know, outright there and forefront with our patients in terms of, you know, getting acknowledgement from them that, 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 you know, what we're doing with the data. And we don't use this data, you know, uh, for any marketing purposes. What we use it for is really uh, innovation and safety. So we use this data to, as we have patients out there with, you know, millions of patients with pacemakers. We're constantly monitoring them on a de-identified basis to see signals out there and detect if there's a problem, we can, we can act on it quickly. Now, you, you mentioned industry cooperation. So I want to take some time there because it's, I think, a theme that stretches beyond data security, but into um, what, what I imagine was a heck of a situation you stepped into as CEO in April 2020 right, where mm -hmm. um, th there was a question of how do we get ventilators out to a population affected by COVID that desperately needs them. There were questions of intellectual property. Do you open source uh, ventilator right. designs? Tell me about what you did in that time period and what, if anything, you learned from that period that's carrying over into your strategy from here. Sure. Well, we certainly, we certainly learned a lot and it changed my personal perspective and our company's perspective on on the, the art of the possible. You know, I'll tell you, uh, you know, just a little behind the scenes story. I was a Sunday in March and I, I wasn't even officially CEO yet. And I was, I was working out in, in, in my basement and I kept the phone on because uh, I knew there was a lot going on in the world. And just in that one hour workout, you know, we got, got a call from the White House, a call from, you know, the president of Ireland, they call him the Taoiseach, several governors in the United States, all calling for ventilators because we're one third of the United States ventilators, about just a little bit under that globally. And uh, right. as you know, there was a huge shortage. So I knew right away, look, this was, they were asking for numbers that we'd never, that the market hadn't produced, let alone Medtronic. And so look- Give, we, a, give a ballpark, if you can, of, of what your capacity was versus what the demand was. Oh, we were producing on it for global use. This that, Before COVID, ventilators is what I'd call relatively sleepy, stable, market, we are producing on a, for, for the, our one third market share, maybe 200 ventilators a week. Right. And they were asking for, you know, like 10,000 a week. Uh, and, and, and the supply chain, here was the challenge, the supply chain, because it wasn't a high growth space, this, this was less than 1% of Medtronic's revenue was one of our lower growing areas, but an important one. And um, so the supply chain was pretty bespoke and customized for ventilators. They weren't using off the shelf products. And so when you go to scale something, oh, and, and there's gonna be 1500 parts in a ventilator and it coming from 140 countries. So it was global, it was customized, and we'd never been, we weren't prepared for something like this. And so, um, you know, we're, look, we're a very mission driven company and uh, we were fortunate to have a strong balance sheet. And we said, look, we are gonna put, you know, patients, 
you know, before profits, number one. And number two, we're not going to be the company that doesn't invest enough. Uh, and, and, and a month down the road or two months down the road, we're going to regret that we didn't, act, we didn't act quickly. So we put every, we, we, we formed a SWAT team around this. There were, cost wasn't an issue uh, in terms of our investments, but still that wasn't enough. You know, what we had to do, we decided to open source. And I remember it was like three in the morning. We'd been up, you know, almost all night at this point. And, uh, you know, none of the solutions were good enough. So I said, look, the team, not to, it wasn't just me, the team around me said, look, I think if we open source this, we can really accelerate the ideas because our ideas just aren't getting there. We ended up, you know, accelerating yeah. our production uh, how from did, 200 to 1,000. How did that help if the, the existing product that you had, like you said, was bespoke? Um, you know, you, you had smaller suppliers doing kind of very right. individualized work. You were across more than 100 countries that all of these different components were coming from. Was this open sourcing a simplified design as well? What, what, what about that, um, that open source moment made it possible for others to do more quickly what even Medtronic would have had trouble doing under the old design and model? I'd say three things. One, it helped us uh, over, overcome the biggest constraint in our supply chain. It was a particular valve called a proportional solenoid valve that that we couldn't find any other manufacturers for and uh, it turned out we got a call from an engineer in spacex downloaded the designs and said hey look we we make these valves for our spacecraft it's a life support system just like a ventilator no one had thought about that linkage and that engineer called one of our engineers they started working on it next thing you know we're on the phone with elon musk and they said look we'll be a supplier we'll focus on this for you and they did so that overcame a big supply constraint Number two, we partnered with Intel, uh, and they did redesigned the chip in this ventilator like in two weeks to give us much more uh, power, if you will, horsepower, to improve the capability of the ventilator. So it allowed us to remotely monitor it and remotely change the control. So healthcare workers didn't have to constantly enter the ICU uh, where COVID has aerosolized into the air uh, and allowed them to monitor you know, multiple patients at once. So it improved the capabilities. And third, we, we formed a number of manufacturing partners from all over the world that said, look, we see these specs. We can reconfigure our manufacturing to do this. And, and we had manufacturing partners in Canada, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, in India, in the United States. So all over the world. So those three things. And it really helped us get our, su our supply way up. Wow. Well, th that's a that's a great picture, not only of um, what you're looking at innovation wise and what's coming down the pipe. We talked about data and security, but also what you've been through um, over the past, you know, more than a year coming up on a year and a half now. Now I, I want to step way back um, okay. <laughs> into uh, how you got to be in this position as CEO uh, of Medtronic. But I like to start like at the very, very beginning. Um, where were you born? Tell me about the household, any siblings, uh, your parents? Okay, sure. Well, that is way back. So look, I'll tell you, everybody that knows me knows I'm, I, I grew up in Pittsburgh. and I'm a huge Pittsburgh guy. Minneapolis, Minnesota is where Med, 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 Medtronic's uh, headquarters are and, and where I've lived for the last 10 years, raised our kids. So that is home, but my hometown is Pittsburgh. And, uh, but a little, and, and we're big sports family. My, uh, my dad played uh, college football and then the NFL. My, his, his brother, Paul Martha, played for the Steelers and was an All-American wow. at Pitt. So I was surrounded by, and, and you know, my Uncle Paul was like a Heisman finalist. He lost it to Roger Staubach, a famous Pitt Navy game. Yeah. So a lot of, lot of sports, big Pittsburgh guy, but a dirty little secret. I was actually born in Cleveland. Uh, and, and, I, and I, you know, you know, nothing against Cleveland, but that, the Cleveland Pittsburgh little rivalry right. there, at least in football. So and tell I, me, what was that? I mean, that's a lot of sports legacy you just laid out there. Was that inspiration for Jeff the kid, or was that pressure? No, it was inspiration. I, 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 I guess maybe you could look at a little bit of pressure, but I, I love sports, and I really looked up to my dad and 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 his brothers, who all were big athletes and. And ironically, I got into hockey. Um, you know, they, they play it. Those guys played all the sports, basketball, football, baseball back then. Um, but I, I got into hockey and, um, you know, played a lot. And my, my dad ended up being, uh, you know, one of our coaches for a while until we outgrew that. And, uh, you know, hockey was I, I played other sports as well. But but hockey was the big one for me that really was really part of my identity. You know, growing up, I, I really I really strived to be a student athlete, you know, I, and, and I thought the student part would lead to a, 
you know, some sort of a professional career. And I hope the athlete part would, would lead, lead to something uh, professional, but that didn't work out. Uh, I was able to play college hockey at Penn state, hmm. uh, but, but that's where, that's where it stopped. But uh, it, yeah. it really shaped me a lot. My work ethic, uh, a, a lot of my work ethic came from that and, and sense of team. And, and I find that in business today that working on a team and understanding team dynamics is so important. And I, I learned a lot of that in, in hockey. At what point did you know that you weren't going to be a professional athlete? All right. Well, I, uh, I had grown up in Pittsburgh. And at that time, this is pre-Mario Lemieux, who really changed hockey in, in, in Pittsburgh uh, when he started, I think, 1984. And uh, hockey was not a, a big sport in Pittsburgh. And so it was, uh, I, I was one a big fish in the little pond. And I eventually – uh, you know, went away to a boarding school my junior and senior year in high school that was really a strong hockey uh, school and ended up playing with a bunch of future Olympians and NHLers. And once I got there and saw that kind of competition, I realized that, okay, I, I'm a little behind here and I don't see myself catching up. But I, it's, I adjusted my goals to play college ho hockey after that. But that, that was probably when I really realized I, that there was a bigger world out there out, outside of Pittsburgh. And so what else did you have that – you were passionate about that sort of either soften the blow there. Like if that's, if that's kind of what you thought you might do, what were the subjects or the, you know, extracurriculars outside of that, that, you know, young Jeff was focused on? Well, look, you know, at that time there was a lot of disruption in my life. Um, you know, I grew up with a, with a, just a wonderful family. Um, but, but, um, you know, my dad was a, a small business owner and, uh, that was tied into the steel industry and the supply chain and, when the steel industry left Pittsburgh, as many know that story, uh, you know his company went bankrupt. Uh, you know, right around that same time, uh, you know my my parents uh, got divorced, and and that's when I ended up going to, to boarding school. It all kind of happened at once, and so I went from this big fish in a little pond with with all what I thought you know on top of the world, and a lot of it went away uh, overnight. And and so it 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 um, you know at that point I was just you, you know kind of trying to. Uh, you know, think forward, and it what it what it taught me was again the the work ethic, but also this this whole idea that take nothing for granted, and that's at that point in my life, I was just focused on you know rebuilding things and achieving those goals, uh, whether it was a professional career uh, in, in business or some other uh, you know medicine or whatever I was going to do, law, whatever. At that point, I didn't know. Um, and, and just taking sports as far as I, as, as far as I could, but the, the subjects that most interest me back then was history. I, I love history. Uh, I love these examples of leadership. Uh, and I'm a little biased towards, uh, you know, U S history, the revolutionary war and civil war and the examples of leadership that you saw and courage and, and stick to uh, it just, it's just humbling to, to read that. And, and, and so that was a big one that I think also, uh, was, was a big interest for me. I have just been blown away just in recent years by Ron Chernow's um, biography of George Washington. Right. And, you know, the appreciation for Washington as um, a leader and as, as we all are, a flawed human being trying to work on being what he needs to be and what his country needs, you know, right. despite and beyond those flaws. I mean, uh, so I, I can relate to your interest in history. So I can actually, it's good you mentioned, you know, George Washington. I, in my home office, I have a picture of Washington crossing the Delaware. I got a, a painting of that and I keep it right behind my desk as a reminder. You know, people think of him as the president, but he was also, you, you know, leading the, uh, the army back then. And they were fighting for like eight years out in the woods, in the cold. I mean, this talk about perseverance and grit. Uh, I mean, this guy, and then as you point out, like strong leadership and putting his country before his his country before his own personal ambitions. I, he, he is a legend for sure. So tell me about um, college and what your focus was then. Uh, you, you knew at that point that uh, athletics weren't going to be the total future. So right. in, in terms of how you start manifesting leadership, perhaps even management interest, um, you know, that, that interest in historical uh, leaders and structures, how's that playing out in college? Well, um, I, I, I knew full well in college I wasn't going to be a pro athlete, um, but and I wanted to, I started to develop an interest in business, you know, versus you know technology at that point or law or medicine. I wanted to be a business leader, 
And um, so one of the things, you know, I re really, I joined the Penn State, I went to Penn State um, and they had an honors college where I was able to get into this honors college. We made small classes in a big environment is what the honors college was. And really close to my professors uh, that gave me great advice, you know, and, and I'll come back to that. And I also uh, became a business manager of the hockey team as well. So back then uh -huh. the hockey team wasn't division one. It is now. It's one of the better programs in the country and it's, it's fully funded and thanks to a lot of uh, benefactors. But back then we had to do, we had to raise our own money. So I became the president of the, the, the hockey club in terms of the business side of it, in terms of raising uh, ad revenue mm -hmm. and, and going out and soliciting sponsors, putting together a business plan for the team. Cause we got some funding from the university, but not enough. Hockey is an expensive sport and uh, to travel around the country and ice time's expensive. So I ran that for a couple of years and, and, and just learned a lot about organizational uh, skills and, and leadership and marketing and business plans. Um, I'd say that. And, and then, you know, my finance professor, my, my daughter actually just graduated from Penn State this last year. And I went back and I was at a oh, restaurant wow. and this, this finance professor that, you know, came up to me and goes, Jeff Martha, is that you? And I said, oh, Professor Woolrich, this is a guy I hadn't seen in, you know, whatever, 30 some years. And he remembers <laughs> the conversation that he had with me in his office. And he said, look, you know, you need to go to a company that's going to invest in you, uh, management training program. And if you want to go to Wall Street, you know, he talked about Goldman Sachs and others. If you want to go to, to, to the corporate side, there's GE and they have a program. And I ended up going to GE and, and that program. And so that kind of advice uh, that I got and experience I got at Penn State was just, you know, and, and just the overall environment there was just, was really uh, great for me. Something tells me that's a story he's told a time or two since then. Yeah, well, he, I was underground for a number of years, and all of a sudden you merged as CEO, and then, and then he probably started telling that. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So um, tell me about that GE experience, you know, um, I guess – if it needs to be disclosed, NBC Universal used to be uh, yeah. part of GE, but it, it was sort of known, especially under Jack Welch, for a, a certain type of um, management and leadership training and, and, and regimen. And uh, you know, I know Bob Swan, former uh, Intel CEO, had a lot right. of great things to say about his experience there as a young person coming up and the the, the leadership exposure that he got. What, what was your experience like? Uh, similar to Bob's, I was there ten years, twenty years total. 10 years uh, where Jack Walsh was CEO, 10 years under, under Jeff Emelt. Uh, my formative years, though, were that, that you know, well, the whole thing was formative, actually. Uh, but I started out at G Capital. So for the first 15 years, I was at G Capital. Then I moved over to GE Healthcare for the last five. But when I was at G Capital, boy, the, it was growing so fast. And there was a lot of uh, acquisitions and entering new markets. And as, as everybody knows, the story goes, GE Capital got very big. And um, I just remember as a, uh, a young management trainee and a, and a young executive, uh, so many, you know, acquisitions, so many new business plans that are put in front of you. Uh, and I saw the senior executives at G Capital, and I really was blown away by their clarity of thought. All this data is coming in, and they can synthesize that data down to, to, to its key insights and the two or three things that are important. And that, I think, is a skill that you learn. So there's intelligence and then there's clarity of thought. I do think you need to have a certain level of intelligence to be a clear thinker, but I know a lot of smart people that aren't clear thinkers. And, and that experience at G Capital with constantly looking at new business plans, constantly looking at deals, it was a very deal uh, environment. I, I learned a lot about clarity of thought uh, and how to quickly disseminate information. And, and look, and the leaders that I worked alongside and, 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 and worked for I, I just were, always took their time to explain things to me, took me under their wing, uh, highest in integrity and, and just very competitive and very accountable. That, that, that GE Capital experience through the 90s into, into the early 2000s, obviously things changed after the financial crisis with GE Capital, but that was a great uh, formal experience for me. And, and then I switched to GE Healthcare. I'll pause there, but the GE Healthcare was a whole nother set of learnings. Yeah. How, how do you develop clarity of thought? I think it's I think it's uh, experience. One, you know, you're you're constantly putting yourself in a in a situation where you're exposed to new things and 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 over and then also surround yourself with people. Go to work for people that are good at it. And you may not. It's hard to define it, but you know it when you see it. And I really worked hard 
uh, to be uh, even uh, even if I had to take a lateral move um, versus a promotion, I always put myself next to people that were clear thinkers and, and worked for managers that were clear thinkers and just learn from them. When you say clear thinkers, uh, and I want to make sure I'm understanding what you're saying, I tend to think of uh, ability to isolate the most important components yes. of an issue or problem and then use that isolation to analyze and execute. So it's, yes. it, it, clear, clarity of thought then leads to crispness of action and, and maybe a, a quicker feedback loop in, in how to solve a problem. Am I thinking about that right? Yeah, the only word I'd add to that, you said analyze and execute, I'd say focus and execute, right? So the clarity of thought, okay. there's so much coming at you. You could say, look, I've got a list of so, so many times uh, I, I, I work with teams that say, look, here's our top 15 things. And, and the top 15 things is too many. And then I say, you need to narrow it down to three. And then they say, well, okay, here it is, 1A, 1B, 1B, 1C, 1D, and 2A, and it's really the same 15. So figuring out the three or four things, ideally two to four things that you really need to do to focus you uh, is critical. And then if you need to adjust, you you adjust quickly, but, but you got to start with focus. So if you're focusing on what's most important, then that has to align to something, right? So is it mission and values then that you have to be clear on first? Is it kind of the core components of what makes a business or a team successful? Well, look, I, I, um, I have a different answer for that today after working at Medtronic than prior to Medtronic. And Medtronic's a very mission-driven uh, culture, and, and it was founded in a garage in Minneapolis in, in 1949. But in 1960, when the, you know, the company was invented the pacemaker and was growing and, and, and expanded too quickly and ran out of money, and our founder, Earl Bach, and the had to get an emergency loan, and, and, they, and, and the board said, look, world, you got to – what, what is Medtronic and what is not Medtronic? So he came up with this mission that really talks about the values of the company, who we are and who we're not, you know, where our focus areas are, what we stand for. And it was all encompassing in terms of, you know, our biomedical engineering company. Uh, we, we put patients first. We prioritize quality and integrity. We prioritize the personal worth of our employees. That, that, that's a quote. From 1960, that wasn't a concept in 1960. And finally, it, we talk about uh, communities uh, and, and being good corporate citizens. And corporate citizenship was not a concept in 1960. Today, it's a, it's a buzzword and a lot of people take it seriously. But mm -hmm. back then, no one did. And so that values, as I've learned at, at, at Medtronic, being able to come back to that, that made that open source decision we talked about earlier a lot easier, I mean, a more of a natural act. Um, cause it, it really came to the ethos of the company. And I, I guess that, uh, gets to the, the question then. So having that clarity of mission, right. um, helps then the clarity of thought. If you can tie through, okay, here are the options of yes. things to do. And maybe these options over here don't lead to immediate revenue or profit benefit. As a matter of fact, maybe a lot of people would argue they lead to the opposite, but right. it's the right thing to do. And it aligns with our mission. And therefore, I mean, is that, is that what you're? Absolutely. And look, like 12, 15 years ago, I just said, look, tie it back, tie it back to making a certain profit and, and at a certain growth rate and do it within the confines of the law. Now I'd say, look, co companies need to stand for much more than that. I mean, it's much more, um, I'd say, nuanced and, and values-based. You know, So yes, profits are a part of this, right? We're, we're a for-profit company and, 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 and we're blessed in the medical technology space to have uh, you know, good margins and, and good end markets that result in growth when we innovate. Um, but that's not enough. And, and so that's, the, that, that's only one tenet of our six tenant mission. And, and the values uh, and your impact. And today, you know, I think this has been way accelerated in the last two years is what's, you know, your what does your company stand for and from a values perspective and what's your co contribution to society? The best people want to go work for a company that stands for something and it has the positive, tangible contribution to society. And, and, and our mission's called for that, you know, since 1960. And, and, and I think that's a real competitive advantage for Med Medtronic right now. So how do you train for that? Um, because it's one thing to say, uh, I need you to know how to analyze the finances and figure out the revenue and profit stuff and you know where we need to focus our innovation dollars. It's another thing to say, uh, well, we're going to make decisions not just based on that, but based on 
uh, this sense of mission and th right. this culture, what the company is about. How do you uh, communicate that, enforce that, um, train in that throughout the company? Because I'm not sure there are great models for it. Well, you know, we talk about it a lot of Intronic. I mean, it, you know, um, and for all new employees, for example, we go through a, a mission and medallion ceremony. We talk about the history of the company because uh, it's meaning it's it's um, tied to the mission. We talk about the mission and we give lots of examples, lots of storytelling. And it starts when you enter the company and it goes on every year. So for every year in December, for example, um, we have a patient uh, day uh, globally and patients come in, their physicians and the patients come in and talk about how our work has impacted their life, uh, their lives. And, and it's, it's profound and it's a, it's, it's a, this is a reminder. It puts everything in perspective. So it's constant. And then we give employees and I have our one here. I'm in our diabetes business in, in, in California today, not in Minneapolis. And, nice. and I'm sitting at one of my, um, uh, uh, direct reports desks who runs the diabetes business and every one of us get this medallion uh, when we when we join the company and and participate in this this this, this uh, mission medallion ceremony and it, it is very if you if you go on LinkedIn and you look at Medtronic uh, employee posts inevitably you're going to see posts about the mission and and the medallion and when they received it and who they received it from and it's 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 cultural and it's repetitive and it evolves and you've got to evolve the mission. The mission doesn't change, but its application, uh, you've, you've got to keep it up to date with the times. Right. That, that makes a lot of sense um, connected to the clarity of thought piece that you were talking about. And I want to fast forward in the process a bit because uh, so much I want to talk about, but I also want to hit some points. Um, I, I like to ask about leaders' lowest moments. Um, I call it Death Valley um, mm. out of the spot in California because I, I think there's a lot of learning from it. But has there been a time uh, in life or in career where you felt like whatever plan that you had or trajectory you were on sort of fell flat and maybe you were going to have to get a completely different plan, start over? Wow. Okay. You are you are going deep here. I, this is like an Oprah kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> I was expecting technology. Yeah, I'll, I'll, look, I'll open up. I told you about my, my, my childhood. I'll, I'll talk about my career, Death Valley. Um, 15 years at, at GE, at GE Capital, you know, always considered all my reviews were at the highest uh, scores you can get and promoted before I was even ready constantly. It was a great run. And then uh, right before the financial crisis, you know, we started consolidating businesses. You know, the growth slowed down. We started consolidating businesses. And, um, you know, my business consulted with another, I was running it. And, um, you know, I didn't get picked uh, to, to, to run that, that combined business. And I found out, um, you know, on my way to my son's fourth birthday party, I'm driving to the party and I get a call and, and it, it, it just wasn't, uh, it's not a call you ever want to see you. Hey, look, you, you 15 years, but you know, you've got, you know, we're, we're combining these businesses and, and you're out. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you get back to the office, there'll be a package on your desk that talks about your exit. Uh, and I, I just was blown away. I, I couldn't believe this. I mean, I thought, I thought I'd retire as a GE employee and, um, had contributed a lot and, and but had a lot more to contribute. Um, and, and it was just a real tough moment. Um, uh, I, I, I'll never forget that day. And, uh, by the way, I never opened that package by the way, but, but, uh, Why not? I did, you know, I was I was determined to prove they were wrong. You know, first I was mad, um, but then I, as I reflected on it, because I started thinking, okay, I really need to think differently. What am I going to do? And you know, I ended up saying, look, look, I reflected on it after I got I was mad and had a chip on my shoulder, which remains there to this day about that a moment. But in the, if I were honest with myself, the last two or three years, I I I wasn't, you know, at my best. I, I wasn't. I had gotten a little stale. I was using the same playbook. I wasn't evolving as much. I wasn't as engaged in my work and I needed something that was more inspiring to me. I mean, um, and, and, and that's, and I looked around for that and, uh, you know, um, that's when I got interested in, I, I you know, in healthcare and, and, mm -hmm. and looked at the GE healthcare. And, uh, that's when I hooked up, uh, I, I went, I'll never forget the interview, uh, it was with Omar Ishrak, who was at GE healthcare at the time that, then he went to run Medtronic and, and brought me with him. And I worked with him for 15 years. He just retired, uh, you know, a, a little over a year ago. 
And I was so nervous for this interview because this guy was a, a, a pure globalist, a student of healthcare, uh, a renowned engineer, the godfather of the ultrasound industry. And here I was this, you know, kind of, you know, wannabe athlete from Pittsburgh who had financial <laughs> services background. And uh, I just went in there and I said, you know, Omar, I've studied a little bit about healthcare and I realized, you know, it's technology based. You, you can't invent everything yourself. You need to learn how to do more acquisitions. You teach me healthcare. I'll get your deals done at GE and help you you know, expand your business and, and, and innovate more f from the outside in. And, and a partnership was formed and, and I fell in love with healthcare. I mean, I found myself waking up in the middle of the night, reading about journals and trying to get up to speed because I wasn't a healthcare guy uh, or person. But that Death Valley, uh, you know, in retrospect, um, uh, was a, a, a pivotal moment in my life, not just in my career. It, it really mm -hmm. taught me uh, that you really need to do something that you love. Working hard is not enough. You, you have to have a sense of purpose. And healthcare gave me more of a sense of purpose than I'd had in a long time. And thus, my, my effectiveness went way up because I cared so much about what we were doing. Now, tell me about that moment um, more nearly in the aftermath of getting this call. Because, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, you as a guy who's uh, whose dad and, and uncles were such a, a in influence in sort of the direction and ambition of your life. You're going to your your kid's fourth birthday party, and you think you're on a certain track. And I mean, I know uh, being the dad of young kids, the, the sort of weight of expectation on that. Where do you go emotionally and and sort of as a as a as a father, as a family man, in, in that moment too, uh, to, to emerge from it the way that you did? Well, I wouldn't recommend the path I chose. You know, the path I chose there was to keep it to myself. I didn't tell my wife. Uh, I didn't tell my family. I just, because I, I had reminiscences of my own father's failings in that area. You know, he, he, he went bankrupt and it just, it really, uh, it was a business bankruptcy that turned into a personal bankruptcy that, that, created all kinds of chaos, divorce. It was, it was just bad. Um, and, 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 but he, he, he's still my idol. Uh, but, but, but I know it really changed him. And, um, I was thinking about that and, 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 and I thought I can fix this. I, I will fix mm -hmm. this. And, um, I kept it to myself and, and I, in many ways I, I got lucky that, um, that I found GE healthcare and I, there was this opportunity and I met Omar um, you know, I would now more, I think, confident in, in, in being vulnerable um, was something I've learned over the years, especially in the last year and a half of CEO, you, you need to be more vulnerable. Um, and uh, I would have shared this with my wife uh, and, and shared this with my family and, and gotten maybe more support uh, because it wasn't it, that death valley, thank God, it didn't last long. Um, it was deep for me, at least. I mean, and people go through much bigger challenges in their life, but for me, that was a big one. And um, but if it had gone on longer, I I I, I need some some help and some some support and some strength. And you, you turn to your family, you turn to your friends, and and when you do that, I think you're going to find you get a lot of uh, of help, and 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 it's okay, uh, and it'll make you a stronger person. I just wasn't strong enough and, and confident enough to, to to take that route, but that's the route I would take today. Uh, if something like that happens again. And so I want to go back and, and get more of that. I always ask as a follow up to the Death Valley, what's the core belief that um, that you captured in it? Because I find very often what it is that brings you through that experience um, becomes a tool in your toolbox that you can then use again and again in your career and, and maybe in leadership. So um, maybe some of it is is uh, a core belief out of what you didn't do and would do differently. Maybe that there are other things. What, what would you say is the biggest takeaway that you have that's useful to you from that whole experience? I, I think having, as I look back and I, and I think um, I'm a pretty, uh, I'd like to think I'm an accountable person. And I like to think that, that uh, there was a reason that something I did not something that GE did, something that I did that why I didn't get chosen for that that bigger job. And and I do think it comes down to sense of purpose um, and that I, I I had lost my sense of purpose uh, at work. Um, I had a sense of purpose uh, with my family, but I'd lost my, you know, you spend a lot of time at work and and you really need to care about what you're doing. And, and 
And uh, when you have a sense of purpose, you're more creative. You have more energy. You have a, it's easier to work hard. You know, it, it uh, uh, you're more, cre- you know, it, it, there's a, so many, I can go down the list. And I think for me, having a sense of purpose in what you do, and that, that's why when um, Medtronic uh, offered me a position, I, again, like I said, I, I didn't see the challenges at that time that GE was going to face. I thought GE was the greatest company on the, on the earth and I was going to retire as a, as a GE leader. Um, and I was staying GE health, healthcare. I was done with capital at that point, but, um, but when I heard about the mission and the and I, and I, the sense of purpose that I felt from each employee that I met from the, mm. the, the, you know, the executives, uh, to the founder, I had an opportunity to meet the founder, Earl Bakken, but to the frontline workers that I met, everyone from even the, the, the receptionist, when I first walked in the building, the sense of purpose and pride around the company and what they did was infectious and I wanted to be part of it. And so I'll, I'll always gravitate going forward to, to work that, that has, that creates that sense of purpose for me. Now, uh, I want to go back and talk about Medtronic now as we begin to close because um, th- there's so much influence of technology in healthcare. You know, the Apple Watch and a lot of the stuff that companies are doing to capture more data from the, the day-to-day experience it is a potential trove to figure out what problems might arise before they really do right. arise. What do you view as the key innovations and possibilities out there that are going to help um, just form the environment in which Medtronic has an opportunity to lead? Look, I I think like today in our current paradigm, we impact the lives of two patients every second, which we think is a lot. That's 80 million patients a year, roughly. But 80 million sounds like a lot, but it's a sliver of the world's population. And uh, it tends to be the sick people. I think that Medtronic has, and medical technology uh, industry has an opportunity to move upstream uh, in the care continuum from just that kind of last line therapy uh, to monitoring and diagnosing patients um, and expanding our therapies. And what, what was very unique about us and very unique about Medtronic is, is, the, is the data that we get uh, you know, uh, from, from patients and from, from people. We put little computers inside of people like pacemakers and implantable defibrillators. And, and we even have a, a, a device, uh, you know, glucose sensors um, I showed you the pill. We have a device called Link here, which the size of a paperclip yeah. goes under your skin. It's not a therapy. It, it, it's, it's monitoring multiple parameters around your cardiovascular uh, health, you know, heart rate, heart rate variability, and other things like that. And it's always on, right? Because it Bluetooths to your phone into the cloud. It's always on. And the sensitivity and the specificity of that data allow physicians to actually make decisions. Um, oh. And you know, for us to get these type of devices to be more ubiquitous, uh, lower cost, continue to get them smaller, uh, and and what I call put the tech into med tech. You know, bring data and AI into med tech, into healthcare in such a constructive way. It's a very unique position, and it will lead to partnerships with wearables companies like Apple and 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 and, and partners like that. But I I think it in it, our ability to take that data and put it in a format, um, it's got the sensitivity and the specificity, it's got, there, there aren't the, those compliance issues, you don't, you don't have to rely on somebody charging or wearing something. And then taking that data, you know, um, using our ability, our algorithms to clean it up and prevent, you know, present insights to physicians in a format that they're used to seeing with the confidence that they need to make decisions, that's huge. And that will, you know, improve outcomes, it will reduce costs and it will drive up access all around the world. And, you know, that is a paradigm shift for med tech uh, right. and for Medtronic. And we have to think differently. We're going to have to move faster. We're going to have to place bigger bets. We're going to have to have partners and we're going to have to be more consumer facing, you know? Um, and, and so these are things that we started the conversation as what's your biggest challenge. It's just how to take it, how to capitalize, not just capitalize on that opportunity, but lead it. Uh, we're the largest med tech company with a, a wonderful history of innovation and a mission. We are in pole position to lead that if, if, if we um, make the right bets and um, form the right partnerships. And, uh, you know, so that is something that, that weighs on me as a, I don't, I, I don't want to be the, 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 the guy or the leadership team that, that doesn't capitalize on that opportunity. Well, there's so much 
uh, riding on it, not just because you know individual people are interested, I think as never before in med tech and health tech as we see in so many ways that people are choosing to buy it, but we can see how much we need it, especially over the right. last couple of years. Jeff, Martha, we covered a lot. Uh, I appreciate the career insight, the personal insight, so much to take away from this. Uh, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you, John.